Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Carbon Trust Supplier webinar on best practices in selling energy efficiency and opportunities in ESOS. This morning, we've got for you three of us presenting. There's me, Jamie Plotnick. I'm the PR manager here at the Carbon Trust. I have with me this morning, Miles McCarthy, our Director of Implementation. Say good morning, Miles. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. And I have Matt Kitching, who is our Implementation Analyst, um, looking after the Carbon Trust Accredited Supplier Scheme and the Green Business Directory. Good morning, Matt. Morning, all. Lovely. So, a number of you may be aware that last week the government launched the Energy Savings Opportunity Scheme. This is a scheme which requires all large businesses to conduct mandatory energy efficiency audits before the 5th of December. 2014 and subsequently in every four-year period following that. Now, obviously, this is a webinar for suppliers and the scheme opens up a lot of opportunities to identify what are the cost-effective energy efficiency projects and encourage the implementation of these. So today we're hoping to take you through a little bit about the scheme, what it means for businesses, who's going to be caught up with it, um, look at then, once those opportunities have been identified to large companies, how to take advantage of them by identifying barriers and selling energy efficiency. So we have a um, Q&A box. Please do feel free to ask your questions throughout. We're going to come to questions at the end, and I will put them to the panelists. So please do um, just enter your questions in the Q&A box and we'll come to those at the end. But quickly, a little bit about the Carbon Trust. So for those of you that haven't interacted with the Carbon Trust recently, and we have a mixed audience today, including both accredited suppliers, other suppliers, and some end users, um, so we'll keep the messaging quite broad, the Carbon Trust is no longer a grant-funded organization by the UK government, but is an independent company with a mission to accelerate the move to a sustainable low-carbon economy. We work across three areas. We provide advice to large businesses, to governments around the world, and to the public sector. We do footprinting, both measuring and certifying the, pro the carbon footprints of um, products and services. And we, do the, we look at technology. That includes innovation, from innovation in renewable technologies such as large offshore wind, through to the implementation of energy efficiency, which is what we're talking about today. So I'd like to hand over now to um, Miles McCarthy, who's going to take you through a little bit about the ESOS regulations and the opportunity in them. Yes, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us on this uh, webinar today. Uh, appreciate your time. Um, <clears throat> just to, just to uh, reiterate the point that Jamie just made there, um, we have got a, a mix of audience today of uh, suppliers and customers, so um, we will keep the, uh, the messaging relatively uh, broad, um, but uh, you're very happy to take uh, questions on any, any points um, as they come through. Um, in terms of ESOS, um, ESOS has been in consultation for, for, for some time now, um, and we were involved in the consultation period. The importance of the timings today is that um, we're just a few days after the uh, regulation or the, uh, yeah, the, the the regulation being laid before Parliament last Thursday and, and coming into force in the coming two weeks. So um, it, we wanted to provide a, um, a, a view and an update of, of what the ESOS is and uh, what, what, it's like, what impact it's likely to have in the marketplace, both for both for customers uh, or for businesses and um, suppliers of energy efficient equipment. Um, so just a, a high-level uh, view of, of ESOS, if you haven't heard of ESOS, uh, this is um, the UK government's um, response to um, an EU energy efficiency directive. Um, and uh, as I mentioned just now, th this was just laid before Parliament last week. Um, the, the regulation requires um, all member states to introduce a, a programme of um, um, energy audits, regular energy audits for large enterprises. And... Uh, this is, in effect, what, what the uh, ESOS um, regulation will provide in the UK. Um, the audits are mandatory for uh, over 90% of the um, emissions of a business, of a large, a large uh, entity, and they will um, 
uh, coming to foot. Sorry, the slide just moved. Oh, sorry, do you want that? And uh, the um, the audits will uh, be required to be completed by um, uh, 5th of December 2015 for the first audits, and then every four-year cycle after that. And it will apply to the the total, or at least 90% of the total emissions of a business, which will include buildings, industrial processes, and transport. We talked a little bit about um, applicability in terms of organisations. Um, the the organisations that will fall under this this regulation will be all large undertakings, excluding public sector bodies. But it will include not-for-profit, uh, and it will include industrial and commercial businesses. Uh, a large undertaking in ESOS is defined as, as a business that has at least 250 employees or annual turnovers of 50 million euros or balance sheets of over 43 million euros. It's worth noting there that having more than 250 employees in itself uh, establishes a business to be a large undertaking, or, or sorry, an organisation to be a large undertaking, and therefore they will fall under this this, this uh, regulation. So, it, it, the, the initial uh, figures estimates were 7,300 large undertakings. Um, there are suggestions that that number could be higher than that, and we've seen figures of nine to 10,000 um, uh, um, uh, uh, undertakings that will fall within this. It's, it's, it's unclear at this point in time exactly what the number will be, but um, requiring only 250 employees will bring a lot of, a lot of businesses into this, into this regulation. Um, when the government uh, announced uh, ESOS, they did make some um, estimates of the of the impacts and the benefits that ESOS will bring. And I think it's important to emphasise that although this is new regulation coming in for businesses, um, a lot of organisations will already comply. And um, and in addition, uh, in complying, it should open up uh, significant opportunities for energy savings and cost savings for those businesses. So these numbers here on this chart are numbers that uh, the government, UK government put out as uh, anticipated impacts and they are in, in the carbon trust size these are very uh, conservative numbers. You can see there on the top right 0.7% energy saving per enterprise which is probably a factor of about 20 lower than what we would anticipate as an average, and I'll show some numbers a bit later on. So, so these numbers are still uh, uh, encouraging in terms of the impacts that the regulation will bring, but I think any anybody who's involved in energy efficiency and evaluating energy efficiency in businesses will recognise that the, the, the size of the cost-effective energy saving opportunities are significantly larger than, than, than that number. So, th so this, th th these numbers are, are estimates of um, the cost and the benefit for a, a, a typical organisation. Uh, again, based on that on that very conservative uh, figure of um, uh, the, the level of savings that can be achieved. Uh, the fifteen thousand pounds cost um, is it, it, it is a cost that uh, has De DEC has put together, having pulled together various uh, uh, pieces of evidence around the cost associated with energy audits. Um, really, the, the cost will, will vary dependent on the complexity and the size of the business, um, but uh, certainly the savings are going, to, are going to far outweigh that in terms of potential opportunity for re energy reduction. And just in terms of um, compliance, um, there's, there's two opportunities of compliance. The first route is, is, a, is an automatic compliance. If, if a business if a business's operations are fully covered by ISO 50001, then, then they can notify the Environment Agency and um, become compliant or, or demonstrate their compliance with the ESOS. If, if that isn't the case, then, there are, um, then, then the organisation will have to go through a process, and this will be typical for most organisations, of um, measuring their uh, energy consumption across buildings industrial processes and transport, um, ensuring that their coverage of uh, that uh, energy consumption, that footprint is at least 90% in the, in the uh, assessments they do. Um, and they will need to then carry out energy uh, assessments looking for energy saving opportunities within that. There is no requirement to implement uh, any energy savings, 
simply a requirement to carry out energy audits to identify energy saving opportunities. Um, and th this process will need to be um, uh, over, overseen by a lead assessor who will have to be um, appropriately qualified to be a lead assessor. Um, but that lead assessor could be both, uh, could be either uh, an external consultant or advisor or uh, an internal uh, resource within the business, so long as they were uh, appropriately qualified. There is uh, also in the regulation mentioned um, the opportunity for uh, individual buildings being uh, compliant if they have had uh, either a, a display energy certificate issued or a Green Deal assessment carried out on those buildings. And I mentioned uh, appropriately a, a qualified um, lead assessors. Um, the, the, the regulation does um, uh, offer, offer approaches for, for assessors to become uh, recognized as appropriately qualified um, uh, under PAS 51215. Um, there are a number of professional bodies that we know are currently applying to the Environment Agency to demonstrate that their um, registers of uh, energy assessors or, or auditors um, are appropriately qualified. And over the coming weeks, we would anticipate there will be a number of um, bodies that are looking to establish that um, recognition amongst their membership or their um, uh, approved lists. And I mentioned earlier, that bear in mind that the assessor could be an internal resource within the company being um, uh, assessed. Um, and just uh, an update on, on Carbon Trust um, standard uh, around um, compliance of ESOS. Um, we do recognize that the um, auditing activity and the approach that we've carried out um, throughout the last uh, two or three years under certification for Carbon Trust standard um, could, be, uh, could, could contribute to the compliance under ESOS. Um, one aspect, obviously, that would need to be considered and looked at would be the, the scope of the, that um, certification in terms of the, the footprint of the business, the amount of emissions that have been assessed. Um, uh, but we would, um, the, but the, the, the compliance of that business under that activity that's, that's gone on would have to be assessed by a, a, an ESOS um, assessor. Um, we are currently looking at um, revising the methodology of the Carbon Trust Standard and, and enabling it to fully comply with ESOS and offer that as a, as a, as a, as a service as part of the um, certification standard. So uh, due to the clear alliance of um, process between the standard and what ESOS is, is looking to achieve, um, it's important that we can provide that to, to organizations that are going through the standard process. So that's currently being uh, worked on and we'll be uh, providing further information about that in the next a couple of weeks or the next few weeks. And um, we're also uh, looking at the opportunity to um, obtain um, lead assessor status for our uh, Carbon Trust Standard Assessors through the process we just talked through. Uh, and again, we'll have some further information on that in the coming coming weeks. I mentioned earlier just the, the overall uh, opportunity um, that uh, ESOS or similar activities provide both to companies um, but also to the supplier marketplace. And I think it's important just to um, look at the, the, the size of the opportunity. Um, based on the experience that Carbon Trust has had over many years working with businesses carrying out energy audits and, and, and uh, more recently some specific examples, you know, it is clear to us that the, the size of the opportunity, the size of the energy saving uh, reduction opportunities, in particular cost-effective opportunities, is significantly larger than the the figures that um, the conservative figures that the government is putting on on ESOS. So that's, that's that should be very encouraging for any organisation that will fall under ESOS, and it should really uh, in, encourage any business to, um, uh, to, to to see this as a as a positive step forward and something that's going to lead to significant um, benefits, financial benefits to their business, rather than additional cost or, or red tape. A couple of examples um, of recent companies that we've looked at. Here's a manufacturing company um, with an energy spend of £240,000, and the 
cost-effective identified energy savings for that business were 41%, uh, leading to a 1.6-year payback. And you can see that the cost of the cost of an energy survey for that business, um, 5,000 pounds, is 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 dramatically lower than the the opportunity for savings. And bear in mind the the, the opportunity uh, saving opportunity of 99,000 is per annum. So so if if even if a small proportion of those opportunities are implemented, that that will far out see, uh, exceed the cost of of um, of carrying out that audit and and in effect comply with ESOS. A couple of other examples here. A larger organisation here, you can see, you know, 35% savings. Again, with a, a, a total um, overall uh, um, uh, return on investment of 3.7 years payback. You can see these are larger op opportunities where the cost of, of carrying out the survey is bigger, but much larger savings opportunity as well. Again, two-year payback. So hopefully that's given uh, everyone a um, an oversight of what ESOS is. Um, it, it is coming in. The, the first compliance period will, will um, require organisations to complete by December next year. So we would anticipate a lot of activity around um, uh, energy, energy auditing and businesses needing to carry out those assessments in the next 18 months or so. And I, I would say, talk, talking to large businesses today, um, we're already seeing this as being something that's on their radar and is driving um, uh, driving activity, which is very encouraging, and, and as the regulation uh, comes in as, and becomes more more widely known, we would see 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 that activity increasing, and we would hope that you know off the back of that, um, significant amounts of implementation would occur, and that should be very beneficial for suppliers in the marketplace. So, um, moving on, in terms of the um, the business case we talk about there. Uh, of energy efficiency, and again, apologies if I'm teaching anybody here uh, in, uh, stuff they already know. Um, appreciate some of this will be will be fairly o obvious or well known to to some uh, people listening. Um, so it's important when we're communicating to businesses the size of the opportunity, not just to talk about today's uh, savings opportunities, um, but also to look forwards and recognise that by taking significant reductions out of out of a, a, out of their consumption today. That leads to ongoing and growing uh, savings with energy prices continuing continuing to climb. So the the size of the prize in terms of what what can be unlocked in terms of efficiency is very significant and needs to be highlighted in any communications to businesses. Um, again, you know the, the 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 projects we're talking about, both operational efficiency and capital investment in buildings and and industrial uh, technologies. Is, is extremely compelling, and it, it's important that we get the, this message, message across, and we get the advice and the confidence to the companies to recognise the value of the, uh, the savings. The, the, the return on investment from those earlier slides and from this slide can be seen uh, far outweighs the typical return on investment that businesses would expect and require for uh, capital investment. But we do know that um, significant amounts of opportunities, even when they are identified, potentially through something uh, approach like ESOS, do not get uh, implemented. So it's important for us to continue to work on ensuring that that number grows and that projects do move through to implementation. So in terms of uh, our approaches to implementation, um, we have a number of uh, activities. We are working quite uh, heavily with our client base on the implementation phase. And one of the important aspects of implementation for, um, for for companies um, is is building first of all the awareness um, but also building the confidence and I think that is a role that um, uh, organizations do come to carbon trust for um, we are seen as a trusted and independent advisor and it's in, and it is a role we, we we can play in in building that confidence within a business to un, uh, first of all understand what the opportunities are where they are in their business but also uh, share case studies, uh, recognise the 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 the, conf the, 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 the benefits to the business, but also the um, robustness of those recommendations and opportunities. And it's at that stage where we're very keen to um, work alongside um, a pool of suppliers in the marketplace and um, ensure that those projects go through to implementation. And the right projects are going through to implementation, putting in uh, right equipment that will deliver what the customers need in terms of um, services. Um, but also will um, achieve the greatest savings and, 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 and good quality um, returns on investment where capital investment is needed. 
And you can see here the, the approaches, uh, the barriers and the approaches that we've been working on for a few years now on the right hand side, uh, closely aligned to the, 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 um, the challenges and, and what our, um, ESOS is hoping to, uh, to encourage uh, and to overcome. So um, we're pretty confident that um, uh, ESOS is going to really drive activity along the top line there, really, in terms of encouraging businesses to see what the opportunities are and build confidence in the size of the opportunity that they can, they can grab. Uh, and that's where um, suppliers and, uh, and, and consultants can step in and really help those businesses go through and, and recognize that, that value from, from this process. I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Matt Kitching, who manages the um, accredited supplier scheme and the Green Business Directory, just to talk through those a little bit more detail for the next few slides. Matt. Hi, all. And, uh <clears throat> and thanks, Miles. Um, so yeah, just uh, just wanted to briefly touch upon the uh, the accredited supplier scheme and the green business directory. Uh, the directory itself has now been live uh, for about a year, um, and as you can see from this slide, these are just some uh, some qualities and some criteria that we look for in a uh, in a top quality supplier, basically, in a supplier that we're willing to to accredit and and give our sort of badge of honour. So uh, we're looking for you know professional memberships. We want to know. What sort of training not only do they give their staff, but do they give um, to, to customers um, when they're looking to implement their technologies? Uh, we want to know more about the, the workforce, what sort of skills and qualifications they have. Um, and we want to see some case studies. We want to see them, them in action and, uh, and, and how they deliver their, their products and service. Um, and here is just a, just a quick quick view, quick screenshot of our green business directory itself. So on the left you can see two, uh, two screen grabs um, mocked up of, of what the directory looks like. Uh, so in the back there you can just about see it's, it's obviously a searchable database. Uh, you can search by technology area and by geography. Uh, and then each accredited supplier has their own unique page, which you can see on the top there, um, where obviously they can they can put their their logo, some contact details, and some uh, and a link through to their to their website. And there's also some space there to give a brief overview of the company. And uh, a lot of a lot of our suppliers like to take the opportunity to provide a case study and maybe some Im some imagery as well to showcase the work that they've done. Um, so as I've sort of alluded to, the the directory is hosted on our on our website, which receives over 400,000 unique unique visitors each year. Um, and really, yeah, we, want, we want to communicate that this is the, the go-to directory for organizations who, who supply renewable or, or energy-efficient technologies. Um, and obviously, there's a wide range of different technologies and equipment that are, that are covered in the Green Business Directory. And um, we'd, we'd really encourage you to go and have a look there. Um, <clears throat> so this is just to cover off the, the process of, of how suppliers become accredited, just to show the, uh, the sort of rigorous route that we take. So, uh, so first of all, it's just a short application form complete with some case studies to really showcase um, what the company is about and the, the good work that they do. Um, second off, we then take the opportunity to do some quick background checks, which we use publicly available data to do. Um, so just to check that the, the finance of the organization, you know, they're on a good footing. Um, we then reference the case studies that the organization has provided to ensure that the claims that they're making are, are well-founded and that the work that they carried out has been thorough and, and top quality. Um, we then follow up that with a, with a brief phone interview. So again, this is just a real opportunity for the supplier to, to showcase their qualities and to, to boast about the good work that they've done. At this stage, provided everything has been passed with flying colors, we would look to accredit those suppliers and then we'd look to gather the information needed to uh, to really advertise their qualities. So um, the the data which we would put on our website, for example, would, would be one thing, and then we'd put in place the the logos and the branding and making sure that the supplier themselves can also promote the fact that they're accredited with us. Um, that process in total, we look to complete within around about three weeks. Um, obviously, there's uh, sometimes delays, so Sometimes the, there's problems with the application form, for example, but, but overall we look to complete within three weeks. Uh, and here I won't go into much detail, but this is just some examples um, and some evidence really that, that our suppliers really value their, their accreditation with us and, 
and that they, they value our logo, essentially, um, and being able to promote the fact that they're affiliated with us. Um, I also just wanted to touch upon really the value to suppliers of being of being accredited with us and the other benefits, not just being able to promote the logo and being on our website. So um, on the left here, you can see a £10 million pot of money, essentially, that we've... Um, we've made our suppliers uh we've given them access to essentially in some ways so these are split roughly into equal thirds so the top third there you can see is um work which our suppliers have been able to to tender for to bid for work uh the second third is work that they've they've won they've bid for and won and therefore implemented and finally um the bottom third is uh supply chain engagement work that we at the Carbon Trust carry out that we've been able to expose our suppliers to and help them um, carry out with us. And then on the right, I just wanted to touch on some examples and some benefits which are maybe less tangible um, and are harder to, to put a value on. So, for example, the value of differentiation in a, in a quite crowded and, and busy marketplace that's quite complex. And as we've touched on already, um, sometimes end users find it hard to, to trust or to, to have confidence in the claims made by suppliers, this scheme really looks to, to answer that, that barrier. Um, so we provide PR and case studies again, which, which really help uh, our suppliers gain the confidence of their, their customers. Um, we look to open up opportunities to, to join us at, at event stands and um, in, in talks and at various events. Uh, which again can lead to leads for potential business. And then finally, obviously, we have uh, the web page views and referrals that we provide to all our suppliers. So our green business directory, for example, has, in the one year since it's been launched, has had around 50,000 unique visitors to, to that directory. Thanks, Matt. Um, just, um, just on that uh, um, last slide, if I can just step back. Sorry. I think it's a, a, it really is um, uh, important for, for all uh, um, green business directory suppliers, accredited suppliers, and, and any any supplier that's looking to, to come on board. Um, we would really um, encourage you to do as much as possible to promote your accreditation, obviously, um, but also talk to talk to Matt and, and also talk to our, um, uh, our our PR team, Jamie, who's here today. Um, does does a lot of work on on our PR for Carbon Trust, but also has been involved in supporting some of our um, green business directory listed accredited suppliers in developing their own PR. And it's it's um, you know, the reason we created the um, the accredited supplier scheme, uh, and we were keen to to promote that uh, through the green business directory is to is to help customers to find good quality suppliers, but also to help those suppliers differentiate themselves in the market and demonstrate the quality and the credibility of the projects they do. So, yes, do keep up your uh, case studies on the um, Green Business Directory. If you want to change those, update those, make them more relevant to your audience, then please do. Um, but also um, ensure that you are promoting and, and um, de displaying the, the, the accredited status, the, the, the logo, where possible. Um, if you would like to um, be involved in events, then please do let us know. We do come to, come to organisations uh, regularly on that. Um, or if you're doing any PR work or, or, or updating any PR work, then again, please do talk to us. We, we'd be very happy to help you and support you in that. So I think there's a lot that, there's a lot that can be done um, uh, in terms of um, further promotion and encouragement of, of organisations to um, recognise this this this. Um, credit status and, and help suppliers to, to, to further their, their promotion of that. Um, in terms of um, just a few observations that we've picked up from our technical team, we, we at the Carbon Trust um, review uh, and uh, evaluate a, a wide range and quite a large number of technical propo proposals on um, uh, equipment upgrades and um, replacements. Um, typically through the energy efficiency financing scheme and the zero uh, percent loan scheme that still is active in in Northern Ireland and Wales, um, but also through some of our other activities, we see quite a lot of um, projects going through um, each year. And I mean, we're talking about hundreds. Um, 
so we did ask the technical team just to pull together some of our observations about, uh, as an independent reader of those proposals from suppliers, not just green business directory and credit suppliers, but more broadly suppliers in the marketplace, so some, some observations that they had. And again, apologies if any of these are, are fairly obvious, but it's, I think it is just worth pointing out that we do see quite a, a wide range of qualities of, of proposals going to customers. And fundamentally, we do know from earlier conversations uh, today that there's a very strong business case, financial business case, for the projects that we're trying to get organizations to take forward. Um, it needs to be clear in the first page that that is the case and what, those, what, the, what that opportunity is. Because more likely than not, the person that is picking up that proposal in the business is going to take it to their senior management for approval. And, and there needs to be that clear there needs to be that clear case and also clear supporting uh, evidence of, of, of what the opportunity is. So, um, you know, it, it, we would encourage um, uh, suppliers to uh, prominently display their accreditation and, and, and the uh, quality of their, their work, and uh, that also comes into play in terms of case studies as well, showing up-to-date and relevant case studies of work that's been uh, carried out uh, that's relevant to that proposal. Um, use relatively straightforward language, particularly in the executive summary up front on the proposals, to um, to demonstrate the, the the reason for for the uh, project to be approved and to be taken forwards and, and the relevance of that for the for the business. Um, quantifying and monetizing the savings, uh, not just energy savings but maintenance savings and other benefits. Again, it, it sounds obvious, but uh, we do see frequently this not being either uh, robustly uh, completed or clearly stated up front. And, um, you know, it, 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 a supplier is missing a huge trick if they, if they don't um, quantify and demonstrate the, the overall benefits to the business uh, of taking the projects forward. Um, do, do, encourage, do, 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 in, do include any um, um, standards or accreditations of the equipment or, or, or the uh, installers or suppliers that are being um, uh, used in the proposal. Um, it, it, is, it is valuable to have um, backing calculations and data and technical brochures and uh, data sheets, but again, having those appropriately referenced and uh, in the proposal, um, it, it makes it a lot more digestible as, as a document for, for businesses to, to look at and to potentially take forward. Um, and we also find with um, a number of suppliers, depending on the technology, uh, there may be an opportunity to put forward uh, more than one potential uh, solution, um, perhaps with a slightly different payback or slightly different savings opportunities to give the business some, some ideas around how they might take it forward. There's always a danger that you diminish the overall proposal that you're trying to sell in, but, but equally um, it, you, you open up the opportunities for, for, for gaining the business and also gaining the customer's trust in seeing that you're, you're, you're looking to develop the most appropriate solution for them, most cost-effective, and to deliver the best uh, savings that they can achieve. Um, and finally, you know, do, do look at uh, supporting uh, supporting information around, for example, financing opportunities, ETL, um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, relevance, which can can help support the proposal and, and help overcome some of the um, the barriers to, to stopping these projects moving forwards. Um, I won't take too long on the on the don'ts, um, but uh, um, they're, they're relatively clear to see in terms of just uh, technical technical jargon, but also just um, uh, com confusing the customer with with uh, a, a document that has all the information in, but it, you, you have to work hard to find it. We our, our well-trained engineers often spend one or two hours sifting through a proposal just to build the business case up themselves, which uh, shouldn't re be required and is, is is a recipe for the customer. Uh, probably not having the patience or the <coughs> ability to, 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 to carry out that assessment themselves. So um, having a clear referenced uh, upfront summary of, of what the opportunity is is, is really important. Um, that's probably all we had uh, um, to cover today in terms of slides. So one, one last slide is just um, a few more examples of um, projects over the last few months we've seen going through. And, and I think this is really just... Uh, to indicate, first of all, the, the range of technologies, but also the, the, the attractiveness of the, of the paybacks we're seeing coming through now. Um, and these are capital projects; these aren't operational efficiency uh, opportunities. But you know, we can see here, um, with, with energy prices continue to climb, very attractive paybacks 
um, and return on investments here for ca for capital uh, upgrades. So that was all we had uh, in terms of formal presentation. Um, over to Jamie to uh, to cover off the uh, questions and answers. Lovely. Well, thank you very much, Miles, and thank you very much, Matt, for that presentation. Um, I'll just flip over to the next slide, um, which has on it our contact details. And if you'd like to follow up directly with us or anyone, anyone on the team here at the Carbon Trust, then please do email Matt. His email address is up there on the slide, or call us on the number list on the number there. We also have a couple of events coming up that you may want to join. These are about the changes to the Carbon Trust standard methodology, and we'll also cover off ESOS once we've got um, perhaps a slightly greater idea on what's going to be happening in terms of um, the registers that are going to accredit um, lead assessors. And those will be taking place um, live here at the Carbon Trust offices in London on the 16th of July. And on the 17th of July, there'll be another webinar, so I'll make you aware of those. Now, coming to the questions. Um, I may deal with the first question myself because I've had to trawl through all the uh, guidance on uh, ESOS. And um, the first question coming from um, Michaela Basford is how will ESOS be enforced and by whom? And quick answer to this, ESOS will be enforced in England by the Environment Agency, Northern Ireland by the Northern Ireland Environment Agency, Scotland by the Scotland Environment Protection Agency, Wales by Natural Resources Wales, and because this can include offshore assets, DEC will look after those. And it's going to include, um, the enforcement's going to be basically naming and shaming plus a financial penalty depending on what you did, um, anywhere from £5,000 for doing it and failing to notify um, the Environment Agency through to £50,000 for not doing it and um, or doing it and making a false or misleading statement. So they can also ratchet those up with daily fines for failing to comply after that of £500. So it can get pretty expensive pretty quickly for businesses that choose not to take action. Um, coming to the second question, this one comes from Michael Power. Miles, I think it's one for you. Um, will there be a route to finance CapEx? Uh, yes, so, so in terms of financing uh, capital investment, there is nothing in, in ESOS itself in terms of uh, support there, uh, government support, but um, there are, um, and this is, and this is really now looking at the implementation stage, but there are a number of opportunities for uh, funding and financing of capital equipment for businesses. Um, we, we, do, we do believe that most businesses are currently um, self-financing uh, energy efficiency capital. Um, but there are other opportunities out in the marketplace. Um, Carbon Trust has for many years run an interest-free loan scheme for smaller businesses, which won't apply to large organizations here, or wouldn't have applied to them anyway, but uh, is, is now uh, restricted to uh, Northern Ireland and, and, and Wales. Um, we also have a commercial uh, finance scheme with Siemens Financial Services, which um, is available to businesses to, to access to, to get uh, lease and loan funding for, for capital um, Equipment. There are obviously a number of other um, banks and, and funders that are looking at either specific technologies, perhaps renewables or more broadly energy efficiency. And I guess finally, um, there are um, uh, um, um, uh, sorry, the words going out of my, out of my head. Um, contractual approaches where businesses will come along and. Um, sorry, ESCO is the word I'm looking for, uh, where, where they will come along and fund and install a solution and, and benefit from shared savings or, or taking some of the savings from that project. So there are some businesses around that deliver um, th those types of, of models of financing of equipment. Thanks, Miles. Um, let's come to a question from Matt. Matt, Julie Shaw asks, is there a cost associated with becoming an accredited supplier or maintaining your listing? Uh, yep, yeah, so, so thanks for the question. Um, Yes, there is. <laughs> is, a, is a brief answer. So it's uh, it's an annual fee of uh, £1,499. Um, and, and and with that, you get obviously your, your listing on the on the directory, which is hosted on our website, uh, with your unique page. Uh, you get use of the accredited supplier logo, which you've seen flashed about on the on the slides just there. Um, you also get, as we've sort of mentioned, the opportunities to attend events with us and to do promotional uh, promotional work with us, essentially press releases, um, and there there are other things. You know, basically get our support. I mean, I'm essentially your account manager 
for uh, creative suppliers. So, so I'm uh, I'm on the end of the phone, as it were. Yeah, um, we've got on the slide at the moment showing Matt's email address there. <clears throat> um, please, if, if you are either a, a new supplier considering becoming accredited or we're interested in becoming accredited and listed on the Green Business Directory, or if you're an existing listed Green Business Directory supplier who Matt has been in touch with r regularly, uh, but please do drop him a, a, an email, <clears throat> do contact him, and uh, if you've got any questions, uh, or to set up a meeting and have a chat, either on the phone or face-to-face. -face. Um, Matt is here to, to support uh, our relationship with suppliers and uh, would be very keen to talk to you about any ideas you've got around how we can support you further uh, or to develop that relationship um, further. So, um, yeah. Great. Thanks, you. Thanks very much. Um, coming to the next question, um, which is one I may pick up myself, uh, coming from Philip Belton. Is there a view that the ESOS eligibility requirements may change in future to incorporate public sector bodies? Now, this scheme actually implements Article 8 of the Energy Efficiency Director under the EU, and that does have an energy efficiency requirement for public sector bodies as well. But the feeling is that the public sector already has sufficient obligations to implement energy efficiency without an additional legislative scheme to call them up. So no, there are no plans for it to include the public sector, but I will add that it doesn't specifically exclude not-for-profits under this scheme. And those that are large enough with a sufficiently large balance sheet and uh, turnover and with more than 250 employees, or, or no, or more than 250 employees, quite right, Mar, thank you, um, will be caught up by this. So public sector bodies won't be, but they have plenty of other obligations to adopt energy efficiency from other schemes. Coming to the next question, um, Miles, you can probably take this one. Um, Michaela Bassford again. You mentioned a building would be compliant if they have a um, Green Deal assessment, but many organisations will have multiple buildings. Is, an organization, is it an organisation or a building by building that needs to be compliant? So the compliance <clears throat> for um, large undertakings is for their overall activities in their buildings, their industrial processes and their transport and any act uh, ESOS compliant activities um, has to cover at least 90% of that energy use. So um, it, it isn't a building by building, um, it is a requirement for at least 90% coverage but obviously if, if they've got a number of buildings that have uh, got a, a, um, a, a, an up-to-date um, display energy certificate or have had Green, green Deal um, assessments, then that can form part of that process of um, uh, building up that, that, that level of coverage to, to comply with ESOS. So they may, may decide only to, to evaluate the, the parts of their um, energy consumption that are outside of those buildings. Uh, and that would, be the, that would also apply <clears throat> to any other current activities or recent activities that have been carried out by the business on particular sites or particular processes, they can form in themselves part of the compliance, but the, um, the uh, assessor, uh, ESOS assessor, would have to uh, evaluate and decide whether that coverage uh, was, was, first of all, eligible and appropriate for what ESOS requires, but also um, to ensure that that, that that coverage of their um, total energy use was, was appropriate to comply with ESOS. Lovely. Thanks, Miles. Um, the next question, coming from John Robb, um, I might have a stab at it, I'll ask you to as well, is um, what's the plan to communicate the obligations of ESOS to large organisations? Now, we do know that a number of these large organisations, certainly the ones that we deal with, were very aware that this was coming in and they've been waiting for this guidance to come in for some time. But... Um, it's not that long until December 2015. And so there really is a job to disseminate it out there. Um, certainly a lot of the associations and trade bodies involved in energy management are going out to their members, which include those that work within the large organizations. Um, there are a number of organizations currently promoting what the um, obligations are going to be, including the Carbon Trust. And um, certainly we're going out and talking to a lot of our um, stakeholders and customers about it, but there is a job to be done, and I think that there's a job to be done by the suppliers of energy efficiency to go out there and market what they can provide. 
because it's a win-win for both the suppliers and the large companies because ultimately energy efficiency is a blindingly obvious business case in many, many cases. And so we'd very much encourage all of our suppliers and the suppliers that we work with to go out and take advantage of the opportunity in ESOS. Miles, do you have um, anything to add to that? <clears throat> no, I mean, I mean, other than noting that uh, with, with a deadline of December 15 for the first wave and then a four-yearly cycle, there is certainly going to be a a push for for um, skills to carry out the ESOS um, assessments and to comply for December 15. I think after that it will be it will be easier, more straightforward. Um, we are seeing large organisations now really stepping up uh, their activities if they haven't already done so in the past um, to to start to um, uh, carry out this activity. And, and here at the Carbon Trust, we we have a, our in-house team working quite hard with a number of different organizations doing exactly that. So I think businesses are starting to move quite quite quickly and recognize the, the need to do this. And of course, you know, the benefit sooner the sooner they, they identify and hopefully implement the benefits, then they will get the benefit then they will get the financial um, benefits off the back of it. Um, but I think it's imp it's imp it's important also for large businesses or organizations to ensure they're getting the right advice and, and good advice. If they, if they're spending this money um, or uh, uh, if they're going to be investing some money in, in complying with ESOS, then it's important and sensible for them to make sure they're getting the right advice and good quality advice. So um, the sooner uh, organizations look at this and uh, begin to um, comply if they haven't already got uh, appropriate compliance, I think the, the benefits are, are clear in a number of different areas. Lovely. Thanks, Mars. Um, the next two questions I'm going to uh, loop together and um, I might pass them over to you. Um, there's a question from Christina Pete and a question from Michael Power and it's both about um, who will be able to be ESOS lead assessors. So um, Christina asked, um, is DECA considered to comply with ESOS? Will DECA assessors be eligible to be lead assessors? And Michael Power asks, will low carbon consultants be eligible as ESOS auditors? Um, Short answer is we don't know. Do you want to give a little more detail, Mark? Yes, I mean the the requirements for uh, uh, assessors is is set out, and um, there are we are aware of a number of organisations that will be that are currently um, uh, working on demonstrating that their um, that their lists of consultants or assessors will will be or should be recognised as compliant. And you know organisations like Energy Institute and SIPSI, we would expect or we do know will be pushing those. Um, that requirement forwards. Um, it, it will be it will be necessary, however, to demonstrate that the that the assessors have the required skills to carry out this work. Um, and, and in particular, it's important that they are able to um, carry out the energy audits and look for the uh, demonstrate the opportunities for energy reduction. Um, and, and as I mentioned earlier, um, we're also looking at our own uh, carbon trust standard assessor pools to, to, to see if we can then, um, obtain um, assessor status for, for, for those as well. So there's a number of different uh, organizations and a number of different areas which are looking to become compliant. In terms of um, DEC assessors, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure in, in terms of the, um, either the organizations that are listing those, but also what the skill sets are of those um, assessors as to whether they would meet the requirements under, under ESOS assessor. Um, but if they do, um, then that will uh, almost certainly be something which those organizations that hold those registers and lists and accreditations will be pushing forwards to um, the Environment Agency to, to get uh, approved. Great. Um, and we have another question. Um, looks like we're coming to the end of our questions at the moment, so if you have any more, please do enter them now. But we'll ask what we're currently the final question from Tom Burnett. Are the energy audits done at an investment grade standard, i.e. Can, can you go to a bank with it? Miles. Um, I, I don't believe they will be uh, to that level. <clears throat> um, I mean, um, my understanding is that the minimum standards certainly won't be um, yeah. done at an investment grade standard. Yeah. Um, you won't need to go to quite that level. However, if you have had energy audits done at an investment grade standard, those will certainly meet the requirements of ESOS. Yes, yes. And, 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 and actually, in terms of the work that we do here at the Carbon Trust, we don't 
we, we don't necessarily encourage businesses always to look at investment grade audits as, as a step they rec- they need to carry out. Um, once once an organisation has the awareness and confidence in the opportunity, uh, that, then that's, that 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 should allow them then to step. To move forward to looking at implementation and, and, and engaging with a number of quality suppliers who can put forward uh, more detailed solutions and proposals that would deliver what the customer requires and demonstrate the savings from those projects. So there is a there, there is a danger that businesses um, invest a lot of money in investment grade audits up front, which don't uh, don't necessarily serve uh, as much of a um, purpose as is needed to to move them through to the implementation phase. Um, obviously, if there's there's a need from a funder, or if there's a need because it's it's a, it's a project that's looking to be included in the ESCO model, then then there will be more detailed um, studies that need to be carried out uh, before those projects can progress. But um, certainly, uh, yes, as Jeremy said, under the ESOS regulation, the minimum standards wouldn't require that level of of, uh, of audit. Lovely. Well. Thank you very much, everyone, for uh, joining us today for this Carbon Trust webinar. If you would like to get in touch with us further, please do email Matt. His email address is right up there on the slides in front of you, and the phone number is right there if you'd like to talk to anyone else. Um, We're really glad you were able to join us today. Join us again for further information on ESOS and the Carbon Trust Standard, either here in London on July the 16th or um, on the webinar on July the 17th. And um, Matt, did you have something? Yeah, the last the, the last point. So sorry, was, was that um, we will be providing the slides uh, ah. to to delegates sort of uh, who've dialed in today. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you for holding on for 50 minutes. I hope it's been useful. I hope you've learned something from today, and um, we would appreciate any feedback and any comments back to us. But we will send out the slide deck uh, following this this webinar. So um, please do all have a good day and enjoy the sunshine. And uh, thanks for your time.